on board right now, so we're going to get started. Um, so hello and welcome everybody to um, another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, um, Clayton Coleman, who is our lead architect for OpenShift and all things Kubernetes at Red Hat, is going to walk us through um, an update on what's going on with OKD4 and um, sort of our vision and the vision that we're looking for um, input on from the community. So I'm going to let Clayton introduce himself and um, get this ball rolling. We'll have live Q&A at the end. Um, and any questions that we don't manage to answer, we'll um, gather up and try and get through in a blog. The video from this session will be posted on blog.openshift.com and on okd.io. Uh, so with that, um, Clayton, take it away and let's um, rock and roll here today. Thanks, Diane. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Diane said, my name is Clayton Coleman. Um, I've been involved in OpenShift for a very long time and in Kubernetes um, for a very long time as well. Um, there were a lot of discussions um, recently, and some of them were, um, you know, a lot of people um, talking about this in various forms. Um, I wanted to kind of cover uh, where we're at with OKD, how we got to this point, um, what I personally can do better. Um, in the future and what we as a community can do better. Um, if there's any comments or feedback, um, there's lots of ways to reach me. I've talked to a lot of people in the last year about what, you know, you know where OpenShift is going, but this will kind of serve as a, as a summarizing everything where we're at and then um, we can take steps forward together. So, uh, first off, I will start with an apology. Um, as I said in the email, and there's two apologies here. The first apology is um, there's nothing novel and juicy here that isn't in the email I sent out, um, although we can certainly generate it as a group. And um, if there's anything that isn't captured, I will make sure to uh, relay that in other forums. Um, but the real apology is uh, OKD kind of got away from, um, from myself and others. Uh, we didn't communicate um, as openly and as um, transparently as we uh, should and have historically done. And so um, one of the things that I'd like to do is um, use this as kind of a reset to say, okay, um, we kind of got in the habit with OKD. Uh, what can we do a little bit better to communicate more, uh, be more deliberate about the kinds of feedback we take and um, uh, do what we can to uh, open up um, better channels of communication and uh, collaboration uh, for OKD going forward. So uh, a lot of folks, I would hope, um, who care enough about OpenShift, um, probably most of the things I say shouldn't be a surprise when we talk about where we're going with OpenShift. In February of last year, Red Hat uh, acquired uh, CoreOS. CoreOS is a um, really exciting uh, company. Uh, a lot of great people worked at CoreOS who believe very strongly in open source. They believe very strongly in Linux. They believe very strongly in Kubernetes. Um, they believe very strongly in the tools and uh, patterns around the ecosystem. Uh, when we acquired them for us, uh, a lot of folks uh, who worked on OpenShift, it felt like a very natural fit. Um, but there was a lot of early discussion about, well, um, we have some opportunity here to really shake things up and to do better. And there's a lot of energy on the core West side and a lot of energy um, on folks involved in OpenShift. And so, you know, over the, the months following that, you know, as with any acquisition at Red Hat, we always, um, uh, we always try to open source everything, but sometimes it takes some time. There were a few things that CoreOS had specifically around Tectonic that couldn't be directly open sourced, or we didn't want to just directly open source it without thinking about it. And so we went through this period where um, the plan was uh, acquire CoreOS, develop a brilliant plan and then ship that plan. And that's not actually what happened. Um, you know, as most of you can probably guess, um, the real world is more complicated than that. So we spent a lot of time in April and May um, kind of trying to pull together a, hey, we've, we've got a lot of things that everybody likes in all these different technologies, um, things like uh, Atomic, and you know, there's people out there who like things in RHEL. Um, there's people out there who like things in um, uh, quote unquote pure upstream Kubernetes. And there's people who like um, the opinionated OpenShift approach with yeah. security. <laughs> there's a ton of tools in the ecosystem um, that were being developed. And you know, we, start, we were starting to see the blossoming of the Kube ecosystem. So a lot, a lot of time in March, April, and May was um, let's kind of explore what we could do. Um, and so 
then you know reality kind of sets in where we um, that we were this when CoreOS was acquired it was about 3.9 if I recall correctly, um, and we ended up shipping 3.10, 3.11. The CoreOS guys have been working on uh, operators and the operator pattern, which is really just the natural evolution of uh, the Kubernetes mindset of you have um, you know some API that says what I want the world to be like and a controller that goes and does that. And sometimes that world is I want a Postgres database to exist, and sometimes that world is I want all of my applications to have secrets um, or have a, a, a private keys that they can use to communicate securely. So the operator um, stuff um, took some time and there was a lot of things we wanted to do with 3.10 and 3.11 to continue evolving OpenShift. And so we kind of got a later start than we would have liked on where do we go next. But that was good because it gave us time to really um, uh, talk through operators, understand where um, the community was going. Uh, there was a ton of work that actually had to be done in Cube, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. But we got a, we kind of got 3.11 out the door, and then um, we were like, okay, well, let's just get this thing wrapped up before December, and that did not happen. Um, we did do a KubeCon December uh, demo on December. I think it was December 9th, although now I might be misremembering. Um, but you know, at that KubeCon. Kind of demo we showed kind of a, an open shift for all the pieces put together. It wasn't quite duct tape and bailing wire. Um, a lot of the things were actually soaked and fundamental, but we were still closing out all the details. So the next day, uh, we all woke up and we're like, okay, uh, let's actually turn this into something that's stable and supported and finish all the edge cases and finish all the um, the whole the gaping holes that we think still exist. And oh yeah, maybe we should test this. I don't know, like. Testing is kind of important these days. So um, a few weeks ago, um, OCP4 was done, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, uh, which is we did that, and they were like, oh yeah, we forgot about OKD. And um, I, you know, some of this was a, a challenge of time and focus. Um, some of it was changes that went, that happened during the evolution of OpenShift, and I'll talk about some of them. Um, your apps, anyone on this call can absolutely call me out and say um, we could have done a better job. That is absolutely 100% true. And um, going forward, I want to make sure that we at least make a better effort um, as a community to say, um, you know, let's periodically checkpoint and roadblock. Um, there were some other changes that came along with the CoreOS acquisition. Um, uh, the other uh, admission is we all got addicted to Slack, and Slack is evil, and you should never use it because um, it gets you out of a certain mindset. So we're going to try and do a better job of um, having discussions um, and doing a little bit more of supporting our um, external slacks as well as um, making sure that our uh, regular forums for communication are being used as effectively as they could. So the timeline for OpenShift 4, if you've seen the OpenShift 4 stuff, it was a, it was a mindset change. Um, a lot of the, you know, very little of this should be a surprise. We did at least communicate these sorts of changes. Um, but I think the implications on uh, OKD are kind of interesting, and we—that's um, what uh, the email and this uh, this talk is about. Uh, early on, uh, there's a lot of lessons from Container Linux and Tectonic that we thought were relevant, um, and there was a lot of lessons from the current OKD uh, 3.9, 3.10, and 3.11, where in OKD we were we we're getting a lot of feedback. You know, upgrades could be better. Um, install is complicated. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, day two was harder than it had to be. And so we drafted what I would call the quote unquote rules, trying to get us to think about um, what is important. And we talked about some of these at uh, Red Hat Summit last year. Um, so again, hopefully not surprising, um, but I wanna talk about the why and how they, they manifested. So uh, the first rule was uh, actually go create something useful and relevant. Um, that's you know probably what all of us aspire to is rule zero for a reason. Um, we don't often think about it. We all want to create uh, good things. Uh, the history of where we were was um, you know, OKD and Kubernetes had evolved. Uh, in this process, we kind of got to thinking, okay, well, we want to create something good, but we want to also create something better than what we have today. And the better was, how do we learn from all of the mistakes we've made to make something really impressive? Um, one of these optional points uh, that goes along with creating something good is um, 
and I've talked about this a few times over the last year with various folks, is um, create the first distribution for Kubernetes. And so, you know, a lot of us might say, well, wait, isn't OKD already a distribution? There's there, I would kind of argue that we're at a very, very early proto phase of the idea of a distribution of uh, Kubernetes, which is we've said Kubernetes is as important potentially as Linux in terms of providing a standard way to run applications across uh, multiple servers. Um, I certainly don't believe that Kubernetes will run all software, but it has a decent chance of being as impactful and prevalent as Linux. And that's a much less controversial statement than it would have been three or four years ago when we were getting a lot of shade from folks about, eh, I don't know that this Kubernetes thing is going to work out. Maybe you should just use insert our thing here. Um, but just like Linux, um, you know, sustained open source communities that um, provide long term uh, stability and commitment to moving these sorts of um, moving these sorts of uh, uh, technologies forward is really important. If Kubernetes is the core, and in the early days of Kubernetes, Kubernetes was all you need needed. A lot of what I would call the distributions for Kubernetes that are out there are distributions of an installer, which is great. You have to have an installer and um, some commitment to update. But I'd say the thing that truly differentiates a Linux distribution from um, where we are in Kubernetes is that Linux distributions have tooling patterns and processes that um, solve the problems that enable long-term support and scale of those platforms. So for instance, um, tools like RPM, apt, and uh, yum were novel at one time. Before those, uh, you could put all these bits together, but you didn't have a way for people in the community to come in and um, package their software and get it into a chain. Um, you needed tools like Koji and the Fedora build systems to do CI testing and to pull all these pieces together. So uh, where we kind of are is we're in the very early stages of Kubernetes. One of the things in the Create Something Good was, well, if we don't think that what we have is really the tools that you'd need for a really sustained Kubernetes distribution, what would those tools be and how can we create them? Um, the corollary to the first rule of create something good is there's gonna be gaps. Anytime you change stuff, you're gonna leave some people and some use cases and some features and some configuration behind. And that's hard. Um, and so uh, one of the things, and I brought this up in the email was um, OpenSh OpenShift um, uh, 3.11 for OKD and OCP still out there and will be there for quite a while. Um, there's going to be some transition as we move forward. We don't want to uh, leave people out in the cold, but it's going to take some time for some of the, you know, there might be use cases where um, for deliberate reasons, we decided that we didn't want to support um, this before because it runs counter to one of these rules. And the alternative um, would be um, that there is a, um, you know, we have a technology that, um, you know, we accidentally left out, which happens. Um, sometimes it's going to be, uh, it gets lost in the shuffle, um, or it's, it might be it's on the list, but in order to get something out, get stabilized and prove that it actually works, we cut it out. And so um, definitely the transition from uh, OpenShift 3 to 4 involves some of those trade-offs. And, um, you know, I, I regret as many of them as you do. Um, certainly a call to everybody in the community is if you see something that's missing, it may not be that anyone notices, and as a as a community and as an open source project, and as um, you know, we need documentation of what changed and, and um, a good uh, overview. You know, that that recap of the last year or so um, was very busy for a lot of people, and I think there's um, there's some things that we just missed because uh, we're all human. So what are the rules? Um, the real rules. So the rules kind of came down to duh, use Kubernetes. Kubernetes, uh, when we started uh, OKD, and uh, in the very early days of Kubernetes, it was good at a very limited set of things. So the, you know, the first couple lines of, uh, of OpenShift code got laid down, um, I believe before V1 Beta 1 even showed up in the Kubernetes API. I think we were still writing directly to etcd from kubelets. Um, it was a very early time. Uh, at that time, and at the time Kubernetes 1.0 launched, um, Kubernetes was good for doing a very small set of things, um, but we're better now. We, um, you know, in one three deployments got added. In one six deployments actually started working correctly. 
In one seven and one eight, uh, we added stateful sets. Volumes and persistent volumes mostly actually work these days. We added extensibility. And so over the evolution of Kubernetes, it's gotten better and better and better running software. Uh, it's gotten more complex, which is something else I'll talk about. But as a rule, Kubernetes is something that's capable of being a better hosting environment. And if I was going to differentiate um, you know, what makes Kubernetes novel as an ecosystem compared to some of the previous environments and open source that run across multiple machines, I would say that Kubernetes focus has always been about running software, all software. And sometimes you have to meet Kubernetes in the middle, but there's no arbitrary line. You know, Kubernetes is, itself is not a 12-factor app. Kubernetes does not expect only 12-factor apps. And so some of the assumptions that went in to bake Kubernetes, some of the reasons why I got involved so early and why I thought it was the right technical direction were that Kubernetes, for the most part, can run anything that runs on Linux and how it can even run a lot of things that run on Windows. And it can run a lot of things that are going to run on other operating systems in the future. But that focus meant that Kubernetes was a reasonable target for running itself. And the tools and patterns that are in Kubernetes make running applications easier. Uh, rule one was, if you can, use Kubernetes to run itself. And obviously, operators are a big part of the story that we've talked about so far, because operators are little bits of the Kubernetes mindset being applied um, to uh, running software that runs on top of Kubernetes. So it's you know, going up uh, a meta level. Operators are encoding domain expertise into code in a way that um, works well with the declarative API. Like, I want there to be a Postgres database. I want to have an object storage bucket. I want to have a security policy applied. And each of these each of these patterns, you know, it still takes a lot of work to write an operator, but we want to make it easier because if we make writing operators easier, that makes it easier for people out there to go build the next generation of tools and technologies that you don't have to think about. Things like Istio and Knative are big, complex projects, and there's a thousand other um, smaller operators that can provide just as much value if we can make it easier. So this is selfish, you know, make our lives easier, but it's also idealistic of um, use operators ourselves, use Kubernetes ourselves when we build OpenShift so that if we hit a problem that breaks it, we go fix it. And there's a ton of examples in OpenShift 4 about this. I have a uh, another talk that I, I'm kind of writing that I'd like to, to give at some point in the future, which is um, what are all the lessons we learned while writing OpenShift uh, 4? And one of them was when you actually depend on Kubernetes to work, you have a lot less excuses about fixing some of these problems. So there's a bunch of great um, stability and quality work that went into Kubernetes as a result of trying this exercise. And I think there's a lot more. Um, you know, just some of the things that I've seen um, folks in like the Ingress work team working on is uh, service load balancers don't quite work right for graceful shutdown. It's kind of a big deal. And for a long time, um, you know, there's a kind of a user developer separation on Kubernetes, the people who use it, the people who develop it. And I really believe strongly in making, you know, everybody who develops Kubernetes have to care that Kubernetes works for both their use cases as well as um, other people's use cases. The so rule two, and this was just lessons learned, is if an update isn't simple, people don't do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of weird, you know, I, we're kind of at a weird state where every software project gets complex enough that everybody's like, oh, I don't know if I want to update it. And we start talking about things like, oh, you know, I'll just create one use clusters and I'll never trust whether a cluster um, has to stay around because I'll create it and then I'll just delete it without ever updating it. And then some people run singletons on their laptop. And you obviously can't do a rolling update of a single instance. Um, and so there's a lot of design points in this space. Um, for, for the folks I talked to, if we wanted to use operators and we wanted to use Kubernetes, um, we knew that you know, most people that we know run OKD and OCP in production-like environments. And they're not quite pet clusters, but they're not quite cattle clusters. You know, they're, they're clusters that don't just have a fixed lifetime, um, but there's a lot of good practices that come with not treating your clusters as being long-lived. And so we always wanted to strike that balance. And so we said, okay, um, we're gonna limit some of the choices around how you run the cluster and the configuration topologies. Um, and maybe we'll expand those in the future, but 
the update model has to be, it has to work every time. It has to be totally predictable. It has to be totally repeatable. And uh, there's a bunch of consequences that came out of that. So for instance, if updates have to always work, um, then people have to really take API versioning seriously. And Kubernetes has always done that, and OpenShift has always done that, right? You know, the commitments to, we build something, we write it once, uh, we will support it forever, or at least until there's something better that we can migrate people transparently to. Um, that's hard. It requires a lot of testing. And so some of the things that fell out of this was, okay, well, if we're going to really rely on API stability, and we're going to use operators, then operator APIs have to be stable. So we've got to make investments to make sure that you know, people even know that these APIs have to be stable. We have to have test cases. Um, we have to make it easy to look at the outside and say, um, you know, what are all the things that are owned by the system, which is a lot more than it was in OpenShift 3, and what are the things that are owned by the end user, which is their applications and their config. And um, the updates are simple. Um, kind of also goes into another one, which is, and I said this in the email, um, you know, we're not, I don't know about everybody else, but when I look at the state of uh, software today, I'm more worried than I was five years ago. We got a lot more tools and we have a lot more things out there. And, you know, you, it's hard to trust um, the hardware and it's hard to trust the operating system and it's hard to trust um, the infrastructure and it's hard to trust the extensions that people run. And I think that's only going to get worse, right? We haven't seen any sign that that's going to get simpler. We're just going to keep building more and more complexity. And so uh, I really believe in the CoreOS mission of um, the only way out of this is to make sure that things can stay up to date. And to stay up to date, you need to be able to trust updates and you need to be able to deliver updates. And everybody has to believe that the updates will work and so that means, a, you know, in a community setting, that means a lot of automation. Um, it's not enough to, you know, there's a certain mindset, which is um, we won't change things very often, and the things that we do change will manually test it. But that doesn't scale well. Um, and there's another mindset, which is we'll automatically test everything, but then we'll never add any features. But then nobody wants to use that. So I think as a community and as a group, we need to figure out how we can automate more of our testing. Um, to draw lessons from the existing communities like Fedora um, that have struggled with these challenges for a very long time, but also bring some, some new approaches um, to say, uh, how can we do more automated testing and how can we work as a community when we hit issues to communicate those issues with others? Um, so some of the things in OpenShift um, you know, enable uh, the better sharing of information about the cluster through things like telemetry. Um, in the open source communities, um, if I have a problem with my cluster, I personally want somebody else to be able to see that we're, you know, that someone else who's having that same problem can see I'm having that problem as well. There's a lot of manual back and forth that happens when we report issues and fix bugs. Um, I'd like to do more to help um, the community be able to share expertise around when problems are happening during updates, uh, share that, and then we can find and uh, fix things more easily because we're all running different software. Um, one person's edge case is another person's production workload. And so the more that we can do to um, share as a community how the software is working for us, the more we can do to improve the, the quality of that software. So a little bit less concrete uh, items here from a community perspective, but I think a lot of opportunity. The third big thing in OpenShift um, for that was uh, in a sense, also an evolution from what CoreOS had done is Container Linux was um, the idea of a simple auto-updating operating system that's really geared towards uh, fitting into a cloud-native infrastructure, which means it can be easily replaced. Um, it's much less about configuring things on the machine and deciding what the configuration is at a at a fleet level. That got integrated into Tectonic, you know, as a Kubernetes distribution. You can do updates and integrate them. Uh, one of the, the discussion points that came out of the OpenShift and Tectonic uh, group was, how can we go the next step? And the next step, in my opinion, and I think we've got some experience with it now, and uh, it has a lot of advantages, is a machine that runs workloads for the cluster is not separate from the cluster. It belongs to the cluster. It participates in the cluster. 
the Linux kernel you're running is one of the biggest factors about what's going to cause success or failure of the workloads because every workload inside a Linux container is talking to the Linux kernel. Um, and the Linux kernel has a really strong API. You know, we talked about backwards compatibility of APIs. Uh, Linux is a shining model of this, but there's a bunch of other things, the configuration on that node, what kind of disks are configured, the network configuration, um, what happens when somebody updates your overlay network driver um, or your overlay network daemon, and that causes a disruption to the app. So thinking about the node and the OS and the kernel on the node as being separate from a Kubernetes cluster, I think misses the real opportunity, which is this should function as one harmonious unit. And so, you know, OpenShift 4, the operating system payload is delivered as part of the update. Um, if you update the control plane, you also update the machines. That has some, you know, initial disadvantages. Well, it means you're restarting machines more often. Um, but what it also means is if we're restarting machines more often, and this is another lesson from Kubernetes, is if you do something all the time and it works the first time, you're pretty sure it's going to work the 10,000th time. You never do something like backups. Um, you can do all the backups you want, but if you never test the restore, you probably don't have a very good backup system. You just have a very expensive tape drive. And so doing things all the time is a key component in Kubernetes success. And I think one of the things that we've learned um, over the last year of experimenting with this approach of integrating the OS and the machines into the cluster is by doing that, you get a huge advantage. So um, in OpenShift 3X, I'm pretty confident that people had problems with node upgrades. And sometimes they went great and sometimes they didn't. The next level up is, well, what kinds of problems happened? Well, some people had problems with uh, draining didn't quite work quickly. And some people had problems with, um, oh, you know, the API server might have gone down because the Ansible script we were running didn't take into account this one workload. Um, rule one was we're going to have more things running on this cluster. If we have more things running on this cluster that have to keep working for the cluster to keep running, it's really important that if updates are happening all the time, that the OS updates happen all the time and they work every time. And so um, as a result of a lot of this work, I am so much more confident in our update process on nodes, which is, you know, uh, a new update is available, the OS needs to get updated, the machine gets drained, new workloads get put on there. We found a ton of interesting and exciting bugs in the operating system um, that actually really needed to get fixed, but no one had seen them because nobody brought these two things together in close proximity. Um, you know, if the control plane is getting restarted and the control plane doesn't, if the node doesn't gracefully shut down those control plane pods in the correct fashion on shutdown, um, you have a problem because that means that API server stopped taking traffic, which means an operator can't go and fetch APIs and the operator throws errors and then it goes into a backup loop. Um, so many of the uh, latent bugs that I think have existed in Kubernetes and Linux individually for a long time, um, by marrying them together, we found and fixed a huge number of them. And we're going to find and fix a huge number of them uh, going forward to where the question that we really want to ask when we do an update is, um, oh, okay, uh, how often during the week am I updating those? 10 times? Great. During these hours? Great. But you trust 100% that the upgrade works. And integrating the OS uh, opens the door for other possibilities too. Like um, for a long time, nodes are these very special things that you set up and you keep updating and you've got tweaks and they accumulate cruft. Integrating the OS and making the OS work well for the cluster allows us to say things like, well, the cluster knows what the node should be. That machine isn't special. On clouds, you can throw away that VM, get a new one, and the machine looks the same. On metal, um, there's actually a really exciting opportunity, which is you can do many of the same things there on metal as long as the hardware's working. Well, if the hardware's not working, that's a problem that you're going to have in any environment. Um, making the hardware, um, making workloads you know, gracefully move off is really the same problem as what happens if you just shut down a VM instance. So trying to line up these problems that even though they're, they're subtly different, by integrating the OS, by having the OS be a step above um, you know, where it is today with Fedora and CentOS and RHEL of being able to atomically update, being able to get its configuration from the cluster, 
you get a really exciting opportunity to um, leverage the um, the in place update model as well as the throw the thing out and get a new one model. The throw the thing out and get a new one works really well on clouds and convert VMs. And the clean it all down to the to the wire for an update and bring it back up works really well on metal. And so there's a I think this of all of the things that we've done and we've seen value in, this is one of the hardest changes because everybody loves their machines and loves to customize them and loves to, to hack around. Once you can get past that mindset, um, treating nodes like you treat pods where they come and go, and if a problem happens, we just go get another one or we wipe it back down to a clean slate and bring it back up again. There's a lot of really um, amazing administrative and operational burdens that just disappear. And that works in the cloud as well because you know everybody has this problem in the cloud in the cloud as well even with VMs. So a second consequence of if we're managing more and updates have to be simple and operators exist as I talked about API stability um, the idea of an operator is kind of antithetical to the set up the configuration at the beginning and never change it which is good because a lot of the things people hate is, oh, that's something you have to set up at install time. And, um, you know, there's always some flexibility trade-offs. So the fact that the machines in a cluster are very well integrated with the cluster means that, you know, even machine configuration isn't set in stone. And if, you know, we build the patterns in that allow us to roll it out. So, you know, an operator manages rollouts of the nodes and uh, changes to config on those disks. The same way as you would roll out a new Kubernetes application. Um, really, this opinionated API-based day two config mindset is every bit of config that you need for a cluster is an API object on the cluster. And that allows us to do things like GitOps around cluster configuration. Um, all of the tools that you might use today in Ansible or Helm or a hundred of the other <laughs> templating and uh, cluster management technologies for managing apps on a cluster on day one, they work for cluster configuration. Um, and not all of the, the settings can realistically be changed if you're running on Amazon. You can't change the fact that you're running on Amazon in a cluster, obviously. But you can change how many machines you have. Um, in the future, we want to be able to let you change the sizes of master nodes just by changing a global config setting that says the size of the master nodes should be this, and a, a, a rolling update of the masters happens, and you've got bigger instances. Um, configuration like what your auth settings are should happen transparently and automatic. So you stand up a cluster and a lot of people who've tried out um, OCP4 will see that you know there's a out-of-the-box default auth setting and we encourage you to set up a real auth that really tackles one of those. The day, the day one just works and the day two lets you change so that you're not locked into the choice of you know at install time you have to get all of these settings perfectly right or the cluster install fails. Um, the opinionated part, I think, is where I alluded to at the beginning. It's going to hurt a little bit. We had to take some choices away, and I can absolutely guarantee you that some of the choices that we took away are things that people are going to want back. Um, and I think almost all of the choices and all the changes are possible, um, but they might require more work. And that work is doing the work that before we might have kind of danced around and say, well, we'll just add an Ansible variable for this. Well, 2,400 Ansible variables later, we said, well, maybe we shouldn't have added all those Ansible variables. And that mindset of trying to figure out the config that really matters, which auth configurations you want, um, which credentials should nodes have to communicate with remote registries, um, what are your proxy settings, um, those sorts of choices we want to be easy and safe to make on the cluster to be able to be done with all the standard Kubernetes tools to have really good documentation on cluster. So an exciting new feature um, that's already in the console um, that will be coming um, hopefully by the time we get OKD4 out um, is an uh, API viewer. And you can go look at the deployments and ingresses and persistent volumes and see all the API fields and what they mean. And you can do that exact same thing for the configuration of the cluster. So you can see, oh, these are the config flags that I can change live on a cluster to change the config. So each of these builds on each other. Um, we know in this area, there's probably the most change from a 3X cluster, but 
I, I got to believe that by doing this, we can make the overall experience better, and we still have room to go fix the problems that we see um, due to the emissions that are accidentally emitting things. So those are kind of the, the quote unquote rules. Um, they were technical choices based on the feedback that we've gotten across the community in OKD, in OCP, in Kubernetes, in Cryo, in 15 other communities, um, in concert with partners and people who are just looking to integrate. Um, everybody who wants Kubernetes to be easier, those are kind of the, well, here's, here's how we can move this forward. So for the OKD4 ingredients, I think this is the, the question where I don't want to preach, I want to ask. Um, I've got some biases. They're just my biases. They don't mean that this is the right thing to do. And I think um, I want to have the discussion uh, with, with all of you, with the folks who may not be on this call but are watching it later, the people who've read the email. Um, do we all agree on the sets of things that will move uh, OKD4 forward? Because OKD4 is a community project. Um, it's community supported. Um, it's a smaller subset of people than the people who care very deeply about Kubernetes. Um, uh, and so, you know, we want to be able to take the people contributing to Kubernetes and to Cryo and to Linux and uh, SystemD and uh, HAProxy and bring those together in a coherent way. Um, we can only do it if we all agree and we're all working on the same tools. We've got some patterns that we can benefit from, um, but I think the uh, please don't see this as me saying this is what we should or what we will do. This is what I think we could do, and I want to hear that. Uh, so first off, um, everything um, is still in the OpenShift org on GitHub. It's still open source. There's no closed source components. Um, the uh, build tooling, release tooling, everything that we have today uh, for building OCP4 was always intended to be able to potentially support OKD4 however it went. And you know, obviously over the over the evolution of the last year, there were various decision points that caused us to say, oh well we can't do this, but we could do this. Um, every step along the way, it has always remained open. There's nothing that's private. Um, I think there's some um, process stuff that needs to be more public than it is today. And um, but as a rule we've tried to keep everything uh, in the open source domain, it's just putting it together requires some choices. So I think one of the things that we need is a philosophy. So the uh, OKD3 philosophy, I might articulate as a enterprise and developer friendly Kubernetes that uh, is easy to install and configure. And you know, our bar for easy to install and configure was pretty, uh, pretty low in the early days of Kubernetes. And as Kubernetes got better, that bar went up. Um, I'd like to, to keep that mission. But uh, I personally, the security aspect, the fact that we need a continuous process, not just a very iterative waterfall type style process, um, kind of led me to, to propose, um, you know, we can build an OKD distribution it's truly a distribution. It has the tools that allow us to mix and match and to allow people to support software long-term. That's operators and CI and process. Um, if, we, if we need this to keep working all the time, I'd really like to make the case for a continuous style uh, approach, which is we trust it to update, we trust it to be secure, and um, we have the automation and the testing in place so that it's certainly possible to say, if we do hit an issue, even after we've pushed OKD4 bits out there, that those bits you know, pause or halt, you can do it in test environments or whatever, but that we have a community approach to um, blocking and gating those rollouts and potentially just you know, saying, okay, well, let's go fix that, let's roll out an update there. Um, that's a big step, um, but I think that it's something that would truly differentiate OKD from every other approach I've seen out there, which is um, if we can trust the updates to happen, it really gets to that original core OS mission of we can secure our systems and our process by having a process that rewards us for being able to continuously deploy. Um, ecosystem components, operators are a big part. You know, we want everybody in the ecosystem to feel like they can quickly and easily automate the features that are important to them. Um, anything that you need to quote unquote run Kubernetes, which today is kind of its kernel, but as 
you know, you've got ingress controllers and OpenShift has the registries and um, you know, there's logging and metrics and people want to go in and add um, you know, database as a service and cloud native integrations. Uh, each of these pieces needs something to manage it. I think operators are kind of the, the yum or the, the RPM repo equivalent of, um, of a Linux distribution. If we can do a good job of making it easy to build and distribute operators and keep them continuously up to date and you trust that and you can reliably update, I think that's something that we haven't seen before and is a truly unique opportunity. Um, making it easy to extend. This one's tricky. Um, you know, everybody has a different opinion. I love it if OKD, um, that you could feel like you could slice it and dice it in any way and use the same tools that OKD uses to build your own distro of Kubernetes. Um, you know, I think you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, you know, why are all these Linux distributions? Um, I think there's a lot of dangers in being a monoculture. And I would prefer that we have tools and processes that um, allow us as organizations or as individuals to build something that we really care about and contribute back without forcing every choice to go through some authority on high. Uh, and if we can do those things, if we can build those pieces, then I think we have the option to always be moving forward in a kind of a self-maintaining way. Uh, you know, that's, I think, possible but difficult. Uh, and you know, I left option two here, which is, this is just my approach. I'd love to have feedback. Um, I've gotten some privately. I know there's been some discussions in other forums. Um, you know, take some time, think about, does this mission resonate with you? Do you believe in a different mission? And if you do, let us know. Uh, one of the choices when integrating the OS uh, was the tricky one, okay, well, we need an OS. And originally, um, and this was a container Linux evolution, there was some discussion about whether um, Red Hat Core OS would be uh, kind of a, an open upstream based distro that was continually updated. Uh, eventually, kind of about halfway through the process, we said, well, um, there's some, some challenges and advantages to that being RHEL. And I think that's the biggest blocker that I see between where we are now, which is um, OCP4 is based on top of RHEL Core OS, and where we need to be. Fortunately, uh, the Fedora Core OS team, uh, Ben Gilbert is helping to lead that. Um, there's a community, the community tracker. They were working very, um, very diligently to get the standard set of tools to ev evolve the container Linux tools and to correct some of the gaps that, um, you know, that we had known about from container Linux uh, into something that could be released. That's coming really soon. Um, one of my suggestions would be you know, we, we could go build something entirely novel, um, but being able to use Fedora Core OS, uh, be continuously updating to benefit from the Fedora kernel, um, to get automation around it, to pull in all the pieces that uh, they've worked on with Container Linux and Atomic. Um, I think there is an opportunity there, which is um, the value in, the, in, Fedora, in a Fedora Core OS to an OKD4 style distribution is that we can really line up those release cycles um, we can work in the open, and um, there's already a set of folks who believe really strongly in, in that mission. Um, but again, like all of the other points that I'll bring up today, this is a suggestion. Um, I'm certainly open to options. Uh, how Fedora Core OS evolves, it's just like any other Fedora community. You, know, you show up and you have opinions and stuff gets done. That's how all open source works. And so if you um, maybe you don't want to um, you don't like some of the things Fedora Core OS might be doing, um, getting involved. Um, there'll be some follow-up discussion in the lists. Uh, at least if we do go down this path, if this is a path that makes sense to everybody, one of the discussions would be we can probably pretty easily pull together a quick prototype um, from the Fedora Core OS preview releases that they're working on and show kind of how this would work um, to get some first steps going. So I don't think it's terribly far from where we are, which is another thing that, uh, appeals about it. Uh, you know, it's certainly, I will say it may be possible to get OKD working on Fedora as it is today, or CentOS as it is today, or Ubuntu as it is today. It would probably lose what I consider to be one of the biggest advantages that integrating the OS with the, the cluster. Um, you need a way to be able to boot the cluster up and tell it what it, what it should be. You need to be able to update that OS atomically and then roll it back. 
Um, those are achievable with other technologies. And so if there's somebody who's really passionate about that and um, wants to leave the door open or to make a case for that, please do. Um, you know, I think Ford, Fedora Core OS has, is a pragmatic choice, but it's certainly not the only one. And I don't want to be the person who says no, because that's not how communities work. So um, that discussion is something that we should also have if um, folks aren't interested in, in Fedora Core OS or want to go a different direction. It should still be possible to do many of the things that um, that are possible in um, the current OpenShift code base without uh, a Core OS. But I do think it's going to be less of a um, less of a real improvement for end users. Um, we need a build and release process. Uh, so right now, the CI systems uh, for OCP4 are open source. They've always been intended to be able to be used for OKD. If you open a PR to one of the OpenShift repos, um, there's a set of PRs that are, are a set of PR jobs that run. Those are standing up clusters. They happen to be doing it on top of um, uh, bits that are closer to, they happen to have in them a, a RHEL core OS payload, but the, um, the actual images themselves in CI are built uh, from the upstream code. Uh, the ones that don't use any packages um, are just using the UBI base images. And that UBI base image is the same that's available for free use. So, one option would be uh, we can continue down that path, use the existing release tooling, add some more uh, PR and release jobs uh, on top of UBI. If there's any gaps in terms of dependent RPMs, um, we can solve that with the CentOS PASSIG or with Fedora. And um, the, the general idea would be we could use the same release tooling and pipeline that we have, which you know runs the tests and stand up the clusters. And um, you know, Red Hat's certainly willing to uh, absorb some of the CI cost. If there's others out there who want to help integrate CI, um, I'd love to start that discussion. And um, just like Kubernetes, where we all, you know, individuals and companies contribute to running CI as part of that integrated flow, uh, we have the same capabilities in OCP, and I don't think there's anything that would prevent us from having a broader set of folks uh, contribute and integrate with our CI. Uh, there's other options. Uh, we could continue the CentOS PaaS SIG work um, and do like kind of a quote unquote downstream rebuild from what the CI validates today. Um, that has some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, it could reuse the CentOS infrastructure, or we could potentially do this in Fedora as well, reuse the Fedora infrastructure. Um, that will introduce some points of difference. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do is uh, everything that we've ever done in OCP has always been with the mindset that we want as little difference as possible from um, the OKD bits, um, where the point of differentiation is on lifecycle and support, not on code. And I think we can stay pretty close to that. But again, that is a point of discussion that I'd love to hear feedback on. Um, in all of the channels uh, that we have. And finally, like, we need volunteers. We need people to help out. There's a bunch of um, folks in the community who've been heavily involved. Um, and what I'd love to do is um, restart kind of our um, coordination meetings, um, go through the discussions around what we can do to get a Roadmap and set of work items, have the discussions about some of these uh, points of integration and these points of choice that we can make as a community, and then um, really ramp that up so that, you know, maybe in a few weeks, maybe in a few months, we can get to a point where we can see an OKD4 that um, people are happy with and we can keep iterating uh, in parallel. So um, I don't think we're that far um, in the short term. But I think it really depends on what, um, where people want to see the project go, and that is uh, fully open. And this is the beginning. Um, again, like OpenShift 4, the mindset, the technologies, everything that comes from CoreOS, everything that's happening in Fedora, everything that's happening in Kubernetes, these all reinforce and play on each other. Um, I have some really strong opinions. I've always had those strong opinions but I want to hear everybody else's opinions. So um, please um, get involved. Uh, there is a ton of things that we can do. Um, I guess I jumped a few, few early in my slides, uh, but you know, I don't think we're terribly far from 
terribly far from a spot where we can all um, get that OKV4 that we want, that we can all contribute to and communicate with uh, from happening. So please, um, I've got listed here, um, you know, probably the easiest place in the near term is going to be the mailing lists, um, specifically the dev list uh, on the uh, dev at list.openshift.redhat.com. Uh, but all of these other channels um, are certainly valid. Uh, any questions that we uh, can answer from the chat, and then um, you know, hopefully have some discussions and build up that community momentum uh, on the lists. And then uh, if we need more, uh, more of an iterated execution model, we can absolutely do that uh, with you know, adding in uh, additional processes and tools. And that's all I have. Uh, I, Diane, do we want to take questions? I might have to stop sharing to see the questions unless you want to just read them out. Yep, and um, uh, Derek Carr has been um, sitting um, and answering some of the questions on the mailing list, um, on, in the chat, rather. Um, and please. Any um, exciting ones? There have been a couple. Um, and and I just want to reiterate, I mean, I would really love it if we could do this um, in the mailing list um, and so we can keep track of the conversation and have commentary on it. This, the Slack channel um, doesn't, doesn't save history, just so people know. Um, the, uh, the common Slack channel, I mean? The common Slack channel, yeah. The, yeah, and the, the Kubernetes one does. However, I will say Slack is not a great long-term medium, so yeah. I also would prefer email lists just so we have a record. Uh, a lot of people have responded to me in uh, private email. Um, please don't be afraid. Uh, if I can certainly summarize some of those and send those back to the list. Um, but, you know, I'm more than happy to, um, I'd love to have some of those private messages uh, go to the list because I think they're great points that everyone's made. I just didn't want to share them until, unless the author was totally comfortable with it. So, um, and Derek, you're, you've been answering a lot of questions here. Um, and if you want to unmute yourself, maybe um, recaps, maybe some of the PDB conversation. Uh, yeah, sure. So hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I think some of the discussion was around uh, general positive reaction to wanting to keep the platform as a whole up to date from the OS to the cluster control plane components. I think there was potentially some uh, confusion or concern on what that meant for the impact to the end user applications running on the cluster. So uh, in the chat there, we tried to clarify that the upgrade process um, that is handled uh, respects pod disruption budgets. If as a cluster operator, your end users applications are not uh, using pod disruption budgets by default and are not running HA, then um, uh, of course those end user applications would be prone to disruption when rolling out upgrades. I think what might not have been captured was um, uh, in uh, the uh, OKD four story here, uh, the cluster operator still has the power to choose when to initiate that upgrade. So uh, if you needed to announce things like maintenance windows or stuff like that, uh, you, you still have that power. It's just the difference is um, we're trying to eliminate the toil and burden and reliability skew that occurs when you manage the OS separately from the control plane uh, components. So um, instead trying to get much more of like an appliance style view where you know all these things were tested soup the nuts together. And I think and that's the process that Clayton wanted to talk through. Yeah, Derek, did you bring up the, um, we had kind of talked about the scheduled updates. Did you talk about that? I did not feel free to talk about it. So Kind of like from the early days, um, Container Linux kind of has the the update, the auto update button is on by default. Uh, we wanted to get to that point for everybody, but obviously, you know, that takes, we have to build trust. Um, so for OKD and for OCP, in both cases, we don't actually have anything today that'll do that force auto update. Um, one of the discussion points was, how do we introduce the simplest possible thing that gives everybody what they want? Um, one of the discussion points was like, hey, there's just a window where we trigger updates and outside that window, we wouldn't trigger updates. Now, obviously if an embargoed CVE comes out and you need to get firmware updates and those firmware updates are coming with the OS, um, you know, you might not want that. Uh, it's kind of a tough one because like a lot of the, the big security announces happen during daytime hours. 
So some of yeah, like as Derek said, like we want upgrades to not be disruptive. If you have applications that are singletons and are going to get disrupted, um, you know, you, today you're already making a choice about when to upgrade. We'd probably want to preserve that even in a auto updating model. And by probably, I mean definitely. There was Any other? A question early on, Ryan um, had asked about um, community led uh, community level platform telemetry health. Sort of bullet. I don't know if Ryan, if you want to ask again to clarify what you're asking for. Is still with us? So um, this one's come up a lot. So uh, OpenShift. So OCP4 turns on a, a telemetry subsystem by default that sends like a small amount of data. What version you're at? Is your update failing? Are your operators healthy? Um, the alerts that are firing? And most of that's just so like, this is kind of like a baby step, which is Fedora's had similar systems like this. Um, in OCP, it's an opt out mechanism today. Um, we're probably gonna clarify some of that, but part of the long-term goal I think is like, these are big complex systems and they fail, you know, the reality is they fail in big and complex ways. Um, I think I personally, and Derek and I had talked about this a lot and a ton of other people talked about this, like the point of the telemetry is to get, there's not so many of us, like there's not a billion people running OpenShift clusters uh, to where you can, you know, there's not a billion clusters out there and so you just look at like 10,000 of them and you can get a statistical sample, there might be 10,000 or 100,000 OpenShift clusters. Uh, the more that we can do to try to see when people hit problems and then just like fix that, I think is a key part. That's kind of what I meant about community uh, support. So like having a way to opt in um, to telemetry for your test or dev clusters. And you know, the set of information like is, it's coming, it's a, a white list of Prometheus things and it's not a lot of data, but it, it is like, I'm broken, I'm not broken. Uh, I think the community telemetry aspect is I think that will, I think that has an opportunity to help all of us improve. You know, how else will we catch when an automated update uh, breaks something? Um, I don't think it's reasonable if you, this is like a trust thing too, which is if you want to update your software all the time, that means you need an automated process. If the automated process kind of ends when we throw the software over the wall from an open source community to the people using it, um, then it's on you to go then, everybody has to alert, never has to move back. I don't know that everybody will be comfortable with community telemetry. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a discussion that we should have in the community, uh, for sure. I think that the outcome can be a lot better than where we're at today, so I believe strongly in it, but I do think there's a lot of um, concerns that uh, we can address in different ways. Yeah, um, to follow up on that, thanks, Clayton. Um, I, I think uh, some interesting points we could consider over time is um, whether people can add the OLM um, and opt in for telemetry even if they're on a GKE cluster and uh, report some uh, metrics or some platform health on their latest uh, core Kubernetes features uh, for the, the upstream Kubernetes community. I know that's kind of might be outside of our scope. Um, also, I know with CoreOS, they had a uh, kind of like a unstable uh, feed you could get on for their for their OS. And I know that was not a popular label. Um, is there any <laughs> plans to kind of uh, use the community to uh, test uh, features uh, the way CoreOS Kind of, or the way Fedora does often uh, that, as a kind of test ground. So that's a great question. Um, I think, so one of the challenges, and like I'll, I'll go like really deep and then broaden out. So one of the challenges I think we see historically with open source software is that the possible space of the is much greater than the software that we can all test. And so um, one of the things that uh, we had talked about that was kind of as like, could you run a single machine in your cluster that runs like an, uh, an early, ver the, the next test version of the kernel and you run a subset of workloads on there that are either like low risk or are like demonstrative. And then could we tie that into telemetry so that like before 
that kernel comes out of testing, you find the issue is something that was like a, it was like, a, that's like a real small thing, but it like, it, it was that mindset of, instead of making it, you have to um, make a big choice. Can you make a small, less risky choice? Some of it's like traffic splitting, right? Like the idea of, you know, you're rolling out a new version and you run like 1% of the traffic through it in a read-only fashion, and then you find any bugs that way, or you find out if you have a performance regression that way before you say, okay, you know, this component's seeing the traffic, but it's not actually doing anything. Now it actually starts doing things, but it's still only 1%. Um, trying to look at how we could do that, I think, is an option. Um, I, I think it is a great question about what, I think that some of this is what does Fedora CoreOS look like? Um, I would probably say that if the goal is for people to trust updates, it has to be secure and stable enough that while there's some risk, the benefit outweighs the risk. So right now the risk is, is that we all kind of get in that spot of we just, we only update infrequently and um, you know we can forget to update, and then we have Windows, and the whole thing doesn't update. So sometimes we have stuff that gets left behind. How can we kind of provide a block and appliance style that's uh, safe enough and secure enough and continuous enough that it, for most people in the community, it provides that right set of value? And it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a discussion that we have to have. I don't want to force it on anyone for sure. Cool. All right. We're, we're sort of at the end of the hour, so I want to respect people's time. And I will post this video and the slides to the mailing list till Twitter and link it into okd.io and um, post it on Slack as well. So it should be available in the next four hours or so, depending on how fast Blue Jeans processes it. Um, and we'll have to do this again. I'd, I'd like to see sort of a regular cadence um, and this and to bring in the Fedora Core OS folks as well who are working on this to give us some updates um, so we can continue this conversation. So um, please do, if you can, post on the mailing list um, any of your questions. We'll try and follow up to everything that people have asked. And um, if you want to join the Commons Slack channel, send me an email and um, we'll, we'll get you on. Unfortunately, Slack is a manual process, um, so I have to add you individually. So. Thanks. Yeah, I, one other thing, I, I, I always forget to say this, so like, I don't want this to be seen as like a, uh, an alternative, but like um, right now, if you haven't tried OpenShift, the OpenShift 4 stuff, and you don't know whether you even care, um, you can go to try.openshift.com and try out OCP. Um, if you don't like it, that's it. Um, if you don't like parts of it, um, that's as just as important an input to this process as anything else. Um, it is the kind of holistic thing that we have today. And I am absolutely okay if, you know, as through discussion with community that we think OKD wants to be different, but if you haven't had a chance to see what you want to be different from, please take that chance. And I'll add the links into that. So again, thanks uh, Derek for answering the questions in chat, um, Clayton for coming to the, the table and, and sharing um, the philosophy and vision and um, opening up the conversation. So I look forward to a lot more conversations and feedback from everybody. So thank you all again. Thank you.